In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, ladies and gentlemen, peace be upon you. We are pleased in the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research to host uh, the researcher Haider Malik, adjunct professor at Naval War College. He will talk about roots of South Asian nuclear deterrence, instability, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, Haider Malik is an American international security scholar. He is an adjunct professor at the Naval War College, founding editor in chief of. Uh, uh, Fletcher uh, Security Review and fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding uh, Tufts, Univer Tufts University and at the U.S. Joint Special Operations University. From 2009 and 2011, he advised U.S. CENTCOM, ISAF and General RTD. And also General David Petrios. Uh, Mr. Malik is also the president of Retiming Associates and lectures at the Naval Postgraduate School. Previously, he conducted research at the Brookings Institution's Foreign Policy Studies, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Hudson Institute's Center on Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World. Mr. Malik, uh, policy and academic work has appeared in a number of uh, uh, magazines and newspapers like Washington Quarterly, Foreign Affairs, the American Interest, Yale Global, etc. He also had uh, editorials in New York Times, Newsweek, the Washington Post Foreign Policy Magazine, and others. Uh, Mr. Malik was awarded a bachelor's degree in economics from the Robert Cook Honors College at Indiana University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in security studies from Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University, and he is currently a PhD candidate at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. The uh, topic that uh, Mr. Malik will uh, tackle is roots of South Asian nuclear deterrence, instability, challenges, and opportunities in this presentation. Uh, Doctor uh, Mr. Malik will talk, will analyze the lack of India-Pakistan nuclear deterrence stability and its impact on key global security interests in South Asia. Because uh, uh, since September 11, uh, 2001, the United States has diffused two major crises between India and Pakistan that many U.S. officials thought could have escalated to the nuclear level. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Mr. Haider Malik. Mr. Haider Malik, you have the floor and I remind you to keep your mobiles silent. Mr. Haider Malik, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, in fact, it's an honor. I, I uh, met the uh, director of this excellent institution in Boston a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Jamal al Uh He was kind enough to uh, uh, forward an invitation where I would come here and talk about uh, roots of South Asian uh, nuclear deterrence instability. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to talk a little bit slow. I, I know there's an interpreter here, and I want to make sure that, that um, everybody can understand. Uh, and and I, again, I'm very thrilled to be here. Uh, I've, I've been promised a trip tomorrow around uh, early morning where I'll be able to uh, go around this uh, great think tank uh, and, and look at the great work uh, being done here. Uh, so very briefly, what I'm going to talk about today is a, is a, a very serious uh, challenge in South Asia, which is that two major countries have nuclear weapons, but they haven't been able to find deterrent stability. I'll start by defining exactly what that is, and then look at the historic U.S.-Soviet Union uh, case and try to make some comparison, uh, no matter how poor that comparison is, with 
the uh, India-Pakistan dyad. Through that, we'll, I'll be able to then highlight some of the major uh, causes behind that instability, and then also some opportunities that are currently bringing about, or certainly have the potential to bring about, nuclear deterrence stability in the region. And finally, the role of the United States, but because I'm here uh, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, also talk about the unique leverage that UAE has in trying to uh, placate uh, some of the concerns uh, uh, that the United States has, but also some of the common goals that both the United States and UAE has in the, in the region, i.e., uh, bringing in more stability. Nuclear deterrence, simply put, uh, deterrence is, is the idea of stopping uh, a state from doing something. Uh, there is a very rich nuclear deterrence literature in the United States going back to the 1950s, uh, Thomas Schelling, Herman Kahn, Henry Kissinger. Uh, and you can see basically the idea is that there's mutually assured destruction. In other words, there's fear on both sides once two countries get nuclear weapons because they are such uniquely powerful uh, and extremely dangerous weapons that just having them creates a fear uh, of not ever using them because if one country uses, the other would react and that would cause massive, uh, not only military damage but also uh, civilian damage, so counter value versus counter force. What Herman Kahn uh, would call balance of terror. Uh, and the hope is that once you do get these weapons, you certainly don't have a nuclear exchange. But that, that has a stabilizing effect. That's the hope uh, in the conventional arena and also subconventional. Conventional, basically, uh, you know, regular armies fighting. So the idea is that because there are nuclear weapons involved, uh, that that would limit conventional wars. But at the same time, it creates incentive at the subconventional level. An example would be supporting a proxy, a state, uh, or an insurgent group against your rival, hoping that the conflict would not escalate to the nuclear level. Think of it more as a spectrum, nuclear deterrent stability. On one side, you've got the instability, and on the other side, you've got stability. Another way to put that is really brickmanship versus detente. Uh, on the top, you will see the historic case of the United States and Soviet Union, but I also want, went beyond the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 to incorporate uh, U.S.-Russia relations. And of course, you have the Berlin crisis, the very famous Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, you also have conflict under the threshold, the Korean War, and then you have uh, wars where certainly nuclear weapons uh, shape the conflict. The 1973 Yom Kippur War between Israel and Arab states, uh, uh, Israel threatening the use of nuclear weapons, uh, uh, the Soviet Union coming in support of the Arab states, and then uh, uh, building up tensions with the United States that was backing Israel. But more recently, the 2008 Georgia war, and then this year in Ukraine that's happening right now, uh, a very quick note, in, the in most of the Cold War, uh, the conventional military, uh, certainly uh, quantitatively speaking, uh, of the NATO forces, as in the U.S. support of NATO forces versus the Red Army, the Soviet Army, were less in number, and there was always a fear that the Red Army would cross into Western Europe. So the United States invested heavily through NATO in uh, installing tactical nuclear weapons, places such as Italy, Poland, uh, Turkey. Now you see a reverse. You see the conventional military balance being reversed. You have a conventionally weaker power in Russia, but still relying heavily on nuclear weapons, especially tactical nuclear weapons, as NATO has become stronger conventionally. So again, nuclear weapons playing a major role there as well. 
One of the major takeaways from this lecture is to look at the case of U.S.-Soviet Union and a possible uh, remedy for this instability is really arms control and reduction. And you see that in, uh, in the case of the U.S.-Soviet Union in, in different treaties, from the SALT treaties to the more recently New START. And of course you have various economic initiatives bringing in U.S., NATO closer to Russia, uh, although we, that cannot be said today because a lot of that has been reversed precisely because of the current tensions on Ukraine. All right, well, let's talk about India and Pakistan. There are several crises. Uh, I highlight about four of them, starting with the 1990 Kashmir compound uh, crisis. But these, these, these are two countries that have fought wars, three wars before they went overtly nuclear. They uh, tested nuclear weapons in 1998, but they fought wars in 48, 65, 71. In 71, Pakistan lost a part of its country, which is now Bangladesh. But, and of course, there was a crisis in the 1980s called the brass tax crisis as well. But starting with about 1990 Kashmir crisis, the Kargil war, the Twin Peak crises of 2001 and 2002, and of course Mumbai. But then constant border clashes that also uh, um, certainly caused major concerns on both sides. And initiatives that tried to bring stability, of course the Agra summit, the ceasefire agreement, uh, the various uh, meetings of the heads of state, and of course a constant uh, but less affected uh, uh, confidence building measures, uh, which is part of the ongoing talks between India and Pakistan on trade, on territorial disputes, uh, on water disputes. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well going forward, which really uh, tells us a little bit about of how different these two dyads are and how complex the situation is. It's literally apples and oranges. But before we go on, let's quickly look at deployable nuclear weapons. These are not reserve nuclear weapons around the world. Who has what? Obviously, United States. Uh, no surprise there. North Korea, less than 10. Pakistan, about 120. India, about 110. Just gives you a What is, what is really interesting is that look at the distance between the United States and Russia. Huge difference, right? They don't have shared borders. And proximity matters a lot. Uh, so while the United States and Russia has to develop ICBMs in the, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, they have to place uh, weapons in strategic areas close to uh, their rival. Uh, Pakistan and India, as soon as they have a, a dirty bomb or a workable nuclear device, they can literally put it on the back of a truck and, and transport it, which of course puts that dyad at a whole different level of, of crisis management. So when you look at South Asia's uniqueness, proximity matters a lot. Frequency of conflict is another issue. I've just talked about a real history of conventional wars, which is not the case between the Soviet Union. In fact, the Soviet Union and the United States fought uh, Nazi Germany together in World War II. The complexity of conflict, this is not just two countries fighting in far off lands like Vietnam or Angola or Nicaragua. These countries are fighting on, they share borders and they're fighting each other, and then, of course, they get nuclear weapons. Now, the exact date is contested, but generally speaking, the U.S. State Department and CIA estimates give about, about mid-1980s, both countries had uh, usable nuclear weapons. Delivery systems, obviously, were developed and a lot of things were advanced later on. India's first test was 1974. And Pakistan's over test obviously was in 1998, but a lot of cold testing was done earlier on. And like I previously mentioned, when you look at these different crises, you will see rhetoric from, the, from both sides signaling to the other side a possible use of 
or certainly a threat of escalation to the nuclear level. Civil military relations is very key. Pakistan is military dominated. Uh, India obviously has uh, civilian dominance. Both countries have a, a unique command and control center uh, that's very complex. And of course, there are organizational limitations just because of, of where these countries are at this moment. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on too. But command and control, how do you store these nuclear weapons? How do you assemble them? How do you deploy them? Uh, what kind of delivery systems? Uh, all of that matters, and it, it creates uh, a, a lot of instability if any of these issues um, have signs of increasing conflict. Uh, what is more important is what happens after these crises. And I'll very briefly talk about the two cases between the United States and Soviet Union, the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and see and try to trace that trajectory to look at what happens to two countries with nuclear weapons that have a very close face-off, and then, and then where do they go from there? 1958, Berlin. After World War II, Berlin is divided between the Allies and the Soviet Union. Berlin is very unique. So you can see the British zone, the American zone, but Berlin itself is divided, but then it's like an island surrounded by the Red Army. Uh, the Soviet Union wanted to push out the Allies, specifically uh, the Americans. And one way they thought they could do that is basically blockade the city and not allow land transport, you know, things that were supplying up to about uh, 2.5 million people. And the hope was that the Americans would quit. Uh, Americans did not quit. Uh, they basically sanctioned one of the largest airlift operations for almost a year. Uh, with, uh, at times, daily flights going in. And cooler heads prevailed eventually, uh, but Khrushchev was not happy, so he erected the Berlin Wall. Now, on both sides, a lot of declassified intelligence reports tell us that they were contemplating at least uh, the, the threat of nuclear weapons. Uh, now, remember, this is, this is a time that's about almost eight, eight and a half years after the Soviets had tested uh, their nuclear weapons. And of course, the United States not only had tested, but actually used them in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Today, by the way, is the 69th anniversary uh, of the use of nuclear weapons uh, in Japan, August 6th. Second, of course, is the most famous Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this comes after the failure of the Bay of Pigs. Basically, President Kennedy uh, had uh, sanctioned the CIA to support uh, anti-communist insurgents in Cuba against Fidel Castro. That failed. Also, Kennedy uh, had sanctioned uh, the placement of uh, tactical, U.S. tactical nuclear weapons in Italy and Turkey. Khrushchev was not happy. Uh, he thought it was only fair to put uh, nuclear weapons uh, short-range and medium-range missiles in Cuba. The American Defense Intelligence Agency found that out. Uh, they had several U-2 um, um, planes that picked up some very interesting photos. President Kennedy told the Soviets, I want you to dismantle all of them, stop supplying them, and you certainly are not going to bring in more missiles. There was a naval blockade. There was a very close call. Uh, one of the American planes went down. These are what I call the 13 days from hell situation. Um, and then eventually cooler heads prevailed on both sides because they, because they realized this was the first time that they seriously foresaw the use of nuclear weapons. Anybody interested? This was the SS-4 and the SS-5 uh, that the Soviets were using. And of course, uh, the blockade eventually worked. Now, behind the doors, uh, Kennedy kind of gave a nod that, they would, that the U.S. would also move some of the missiles away from Italy and Turkey, and that was the main concern of the Soviets. This is one of the, the photos that the U-2 uh, plane took, and you can kind of see the, the missile reactor up on the, in the north. You can see the tent, and there were many more photos that came during that time. And again, 
uh, just to look at the actual nuclear stockpile during that time. Uh, not a lot, but certainly in the 1960s and 70s, enough, again, remember that, that the first bar is 5,000 uh, nuclear warheads. So significant number of nuclear warheads existed and they could be used and there was a real fear during the missile, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. So what happens after these close calls? Well, a lot of arm control and arm reduction talks start right away. And you can see that in that graph right there. Uh, also, some of the more recent ones, the 2010 New Start. Um, and that's one of the best ways that the uh, US and the Soviets tried to resolve that dilemma. Uh, increasing transparency, uh, hotlines were established, uh, trust but verify. Uh, Soviet uh, inspectors were allowed to come to the United States, the US. Inspectors went to the, to the Soviet Union, and overall, after a while, they realized that they needed to reduce the actual number, and you see that major decline going forward. So was there stability? Certainly, yes. Um, no nuclear exchange, but wars continued. Um, state proxies and non-state proxies. Uh, state proxies, obviously, the, uh, the Vietnam being one of the most famous ones. But even in the India-Pakistan wars, both countries started to take sides in supplying arms. And then, of course, they also fomented different insurgent groups in Latin America uh, and Africa. Uh, but they did increase in transparency and communication. Uh, but remember, this is not sticky. This is not something that, that, that's given just because you have signed an arms control agreement that you would have stability. Uh, you look at uh, Georgia and you look at Ukraine and you can see that th there have been some reversal there. Now let's quickly look at the four crises in the India-Pakistan case and then try to track the trajectory of, of where these countries eventually ended up. The 1990 compound crisis uh, is really the first time actually the second time after Brass Stacks, 1986, when both countries um, had a face-off and both countries signaled to the United States that not only did they have nuclear weapons, but if, uh, uh, if the situation gets to a point, especially from the Pakistani side, uh, where they have lost significant territory because of, of the Indian push in, for example, uh, Pakistan's Sindh province or Punjab, the soft underbelly, uh, cutting uh, Pakistan in half that they would certainly contemplate using those very nuclear weapons. But what exactly happened? Uh, in the 1980s, Pakistan, both Pakistan and India have supported insurgent groups. Pakistan has, has supported uh, at times more robustly and certainly we know about the support uh, more so, but India has as well. And Pakistan supported uh, a pro-independence movement in 1980s, the Khalistan movement, basically the Sikh uh, minority, uh, which is a majority in the, uh, in the Indian-administered uh, Punjab or Indian Territory Punjab, uh, supported that movement, hoping to bog down the Indian, Indian military. They did the same thing uh, in the 90s by supporting a pro-independence or certainly pro-Pakistan uh, movement in Kashmir by uh, supporting insurgent groups there. This of course triggered uh, a response from the Indians and they started to uh, deploy troops. Now again, in brass stacks and, and also in 1990, um, the cover story was always an exercise. In other words, we're exercising, this is nothing out of the blue. Uh, in other words, one or two Indian strike corps would, would get uh, there and, and the Pakistanis would react right after that. So about 300 troops. United States obviously intervened and there were of course uh, uh, nuclear threats. More from the Pakistani side for obvious reason because it's uh, conventionally weak uh, military uh, and, and, and that moved forward. About Nine years later, and literally about a year after the two countries tested their nuclear weapons, uh, they had a, a, a major crisis in a small town 
on the line of control which divides the Indian administered and the Pakistani administered uh, Kashmir. Uh, fairly close to the capital of Pakistan, Srinagar is the, is the main city in uh, Indian administered Kashmir and Kargil is right there. Let's have a closer look. This is the line of control. Uh, Pakistani uh, or Pakistani-backed uh, Kashmiri insurgents, along with uh, what many uh, found out later, were regular Pakistani troops, but without uniform supporting them, took over strategic uh, sites in the Tiger Hill area, uh, right next to Kargil, and also some areas uh, in the north uh, east. This led to a major crisis. Um, the overall death count was over a thousand, and you know, in security studies, we usually code a, a, a conflict, a, a war, when a thousand casualties occur, or war-related uh, casualties. That's our, these are actual soldiers on both sides as war. So certainly, that's why many call it the Kargil War. The United States again. Uh, intervene, but what is very interesting here is that something similar happened in 1965. But India's reaction was very different. It basically opened another front, uh, whether in Sindh or in Punjab. This time, because both countries had nuclear weapons, India, not only not did it open, you know, it did not open another front in the pa Pakistan's soft underbelly, but also specific instructions were given not to cross the line of control, even as uh, the Indians pushed out uh, Pakistani insurgents and some regulars. So there was certainly nuclear deterrence was working in that sense, uh, that, that the Indian uh, Prime Minister was certainly uh, deterred from opening another front. The United States obviously stepped in. Uh, this is a major crisis. Both countries have gone overtly nuclear only a year ago. Uh, so this was a major deal. Now. The next crisis, again, goes back to Pakistan's support for these uh, sub-state elements. Again, pro-Kashmir insurgents attacked the parliament, Josh e. Muhammad and Swam Lashkar e. Taiba. Um, Pakistan, after several months of pressure from the United States, finally uh, banned these outfits. Some of them would come back later under new names. But that placated some of the cons uh, major fears of the, of the Indian side. But the, the real fear that the Indians had was Pakistan's uh, declared first use strategy. In other words, Pakistan would use, and continues to say this, will use nuclear weapons on the Indian army if it crossed into the border after cer certain purposefully ambiguous red lines are crossed. And of course, US pressure. So those are two kind of the two Common, uh, 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 common factors that you'll see, U.S. pressure and then uh, Pakistan uh, uh, first use threat. Now you remember in these kind of crises, you usually have about 72 hours. So um, there was a lot of pressure on the Indian government to perhaps have airstrikes inside Pakistani territory very quickly against suspected uh, training camps of these uh, insurgent groups. And they did not. Also, they realized that their strike corps were very uh, difficult to mobilize. It took weeks for the first, uh, the three strike corps to kind of come. Total strike corps are about five. Three of them had to come closer. Logistics, things like that. So uh, they realized that they needed to make mobilization faster and then maybe have a, a, a stronger strategy in case this happens again. Um, that was then later called the Cold Start Doctrine, which is very relevant in the next case. But if you look at the, the three strike corps, which will then match by uh, the Pakistani uh, 11th Corps, the 31st Corps, and the 5th Corps, then comes the next crisis, which is about six years after this one, Mumbai. And then, of course, the 11. Pakistan-based LET members attack uh, several sites, kill about 164 Indians in the city of Mumbai, which is the economic heart of the country. Um, they kill American citizens. 
Um, and uh, all of them die except one of them who later on confesses. And then I, I believe last year uh, got the death penalty in, in the Indian court. Again, they have this very narrow window of about 72 hours when a lot of pressure builds up in Delhi that we need to at least go across the border and, and, and uh, through airstrikes attack uh, training camps. That did not happen. And once that window is gone, and again, U.S. pressure and Pakistan's declared first use strategy, uh, first use of nuclear weapons, put tremendous pressure. But there was also pressure from within India, especially the, um, the business elite uh, and, and people who were more concerned about India's economic growth, that this would push India down into a black hole, uh, that a lot of foreign direct investment would leave, that, that they have to take this hit. Uh, the mobilization was a little bit faster of the strike corps, the Indian strike corps, than the 2001-2002 crisis, but certainly not as fast as they had hoped. So while they had cold start, uh, nothing really was done. Now over time, through pressure, Pakistan started trials against uh, people, uh, suspected people, um, and, 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 uh, and that placated some of the, uh, the fears the Indians had. What happened after these close calls? Well, um, while some efforts were done to increase stability, uh, not much else happened, precisely because of these seven factors. And I'll talk in detail about them. But if you look at the, the Soviet Union and the United States case, and you look at just the actors, certainly rational actors, but unitary actors also have control over the entire territory. Now, some would argue that there are pockets of territory in India, you know, in the Northeast and, and the Northwest that they don't have full control over, and that's true. But what is more important is the lack of control that Pakistan has on the federally missed tribal areas, you know, home to groups like Al Qaeda, the Pakistani Taliban. And that's a real concern, which was not obviously the case with the US Soviet Union. Now, this is similar. Pakistan does not accept the status quo. India would like the status quo, especially on the disputed territory of Kashmir. And of course, the idea uh, uh, that Pakistan is an illiberal democracy or certainly a fledgling democracy with military dominance. Uh, here, of course, the major point is really shared borders. And, and the second point really is that while the Soviet Union and United States supported insurgent groups, they never supported them inside the territory of their rival, and they didn't share borders. So this is a very important key uh, difference between these two dyads. And that just increases the stakes to a whole different level. And of course, they have natural uh, disputes, and, you know, natural resources, especially water. The Indus Water Treaty, uh, which was signed in 1960, but since then, the construction of, of dams by India, for example, has uh, made many in Pakistan nervous about uh, uh, water scarcity. There's, a, there's an actual history of wars and no alliance ever, no war alliance, uh, which was not the case. And of course, soldiers every day engaged in combat to some degree, facing off each other. I think today the Pakistanis arrested a Indian BSF, which is a border, border security force personnel who had crossed into Pakistani territory. So this is a real concern. And then of course, you have this moral hazard. Pakistan realizes that because when there is a crisis, the United States and frankly the entire world will certainly step in, then they could probably um, not only have more of these crises, but certainly get more leverage out of them. That creates a moral hazard. And then there's insecurity on, on all levels, not just the uh, uh, over here as well. So in the Soviet Union, there was certainly instability under the threshold, which is that you supported insurgent groups or proxy states in far off lands. But here you have instability on both sides at the nuclear level as well. And I talk a little bit about nuclear security and command and control uh, concerns as well. 
They haven't really signed major treaties, certainly don't have major arms uh, disarmament initiatives at play. Now there's obviously a fear of nuclear showdown. We saw that in Cargill, just like Cuba. But really no uh, major steps taken on each side, uh, even after major military loss. And of course you have uh, concerns with storage, assembly, delivery mechanisms, command and control. One of the ways that Pakistan makes its threat credible is that it has been heavily investing in tactical nuclear weapons. And one way you can signal to the enemy the, the very use of nuclear weapons is that you have to be able to use it as fast as possible in, in times of crisis. That means that the different components of the nuclear weapon have to be very close. So they have to be made it fairly quickly, either put on a missile or on an F-16, and then delivered. That also kind of delegates authority to the commander level, and that can be a real concern. Also, the, the lack of civilian leadership is a main concern. In India, you have some other concerns where they're still trying to develop uh, more robust systems. Uh, there's corruption in the nuclear sector. Uh, and of course, there's on both sides, but especially Pakistan, major threat of domestic terrorism. This comes from the nuclear threat initiative. So let's look at the gold standard. That's kind of where you want to be. Uh, so lower the rank, the better. OK, so security control and you look at Pakistan, uh, the rank is 23. That, like I said, lower the better. Uh, but very similar if you look at uh, the rank um, of India as well. Not much difference there other than, of course, on-site physical protection. India is a little bit better. But if you look at insider threat, that's really the main concern here. Um, but if you look at insider threat, there's actually less of an insider threat in Pakistan than there is in India. So again, this, this is not cut and dry. Uh, and the United States has been supporting initiatives inside Pakistan to, to make their uh, nuclear weapons safer. Now the good news. So over the last 10 years, a lot of uh, major Pakistani political parties, but also a change of thinking, very slow, but, but nonetheless some change of thinking in the military leadership as well, that some of the major concerns with India may have to go into the back burner. And you see that with some of the confidence building measures going on right now. Very little talk of Kashmir, for example, or Sir Creek, but most, more focus on, on trade. With some estimates, uh, trade is about 2.6 billion right now between the two countries. Just to give you a contrast, UAE and India trade balance, uh, sorry, trade, uh, Trade is about 75 billion. Between, um, between Pakistan and India, 2.6 billion, with an easily potential of, of, of 10, 15 billion if certain restrictions are taken off on both sides and if they uh, end up signing a free trading union. They have a lot of ethnic uh, and religious overlap. About 180 million Muslims live in India. Uh, they share each other's food, and you've heard this many times, you know, watch similar movies. And they have these major initiatives by NGOs. Aman Ki Asha is, being, uh, is one of them. Uh, that tries to bring the countries together. They have you know, a lot of uh, the intelligentsia from both sides tries to get together through conferences and things like that. And they're trying to push their leadership towards some kind of, again, lessening of tensions. And then, of course, they have, have great precedents. They have the Indus Water Treaty that has, been, has not been violated. It was a major issue. Think about it. Indus flows from the Himalayas through the Indian territory into Pakistan, but they came together in 1960, and, and uh, they're sticking with it. So it's not as if they can't do it. Uh, there's certainly got their um, potential there. And again, this is repeating what I just said. Now the interesting question, UAE, we're right here. Uh, how, what kind of leverage the, the UAE has? And I, I'll talk very briefly about the United States. I think it's more important to talk about UAE for obvious reasons. And of course, when it comes to pa Pakistan or, or India, major historic, culture, and economic ties. Pakistan military to military relationship goes back to the 1960s. I was talking to the current uh, Pakistani ambassador 
uh, just now, a few minutes ago, and we were discussing how the UAE Air Force was, was uh, manned by uh, and led by a Pakistani. Uh, the major uh, naval institute here has that. So a very robust military-to-military -military corporation. Uh, major uh, 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 Pakistanis make up uh, a major part of the population. And of course, there's a, there's, there's a history of, 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 of UAE aid going to the Pakistanis and also uh, trade. But if I had to pick one side, I think it's more of a, a security-centric uh, relationship. With India, it's more economic. And when it's economic, it's, it's really about oil. 75 billion trade volume, uh, UAE's five, fifth largest. And uh, in the MENA area, the Middle East, North uh, Africa area, UAE is India's largest. Uh, and last year, Indian diasporas in UAE uh, sent back more money than Indian diaspora in the United States. So it's the largest amount of remittances going back. UAE is right now working on a strategic oil reserve project with the Indians. They have signed what's the bilateral uh, investment promotion and protection agreement, uh, allowing UAE firms to invest heavily in Indian infrastructure. Uh, which uh, has privatized, I mean, I think the price tag is about a trillion dollars and, and the Indians have, have allowed private companies up to 55% of investment. Uh, Indian uh, UAE investment is fairly high uh, in those areas, generally speaking, as well. But also defense partnership, which was not the norm, but is becoming one. Naval exercises um, and an extradition treaty. Uh, and yet they are major concerns when it comes to uh, Israel and Iran. So obviously, Pakistan and India have to make those tough choices, right? They don't have to necessarily follow the path of the United States and the Soviet Union. But certainly, the United States and UAE have leverage, right, when it comes to economic, military, and energy. And frankly, they have common goals, right? They definitely want to see fewer terrorists in the area, certainly want the nuclear weapons to be safe and they want overall regional stability, because that's how you make money. That's how you sustain relationships. That's how you make sure that the country is secure for foreign direct investment. So acting as a bridge, promoting more military-to-military -military communication, perhaps starting talks on arms control, and then trying to reduce some of the risky behavior. Uh, Pakistan is investing heavily on tactical nuclear weapons as we speak. Uh, shifting from uranium to plutonium. Pluto one of the best things about plutonium is you can make very high-yielding weapons uh, that are fairly small. And that means that those will be, have to be incorporated, you know, almost at the level of artery shells. That's a very dangerous notion. India, on the other hand, in the last five years, has invested heavily on, on defense uh, satellites, trying to come up with a way of, of preempting any kind of mobilization or nuclear mobilization from Pakistan. In other words, have enough information to uh, limit Pakistani options, which of course you know, puts a lot of pressure on the Pakistanis who would like to have a secure second strike capability um, and, and, and try to diversify. So these are, these, are, these are kind of behaviors that should be discouraged, and trade, on the other hand, should certainly be encouraged. Uh, the bottom line, there's definitely major challenges between India and Pakistan when it comes to nuclear deterrence uh, stability issues, but also some great prospects, some great opportunities. And I, I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malik, for this interesting lecture. I will now take some of the questions. I wish from the audience who would like to ask any question to please identify themselves and make the question clear and brief, please. Yes. To the front row, please. Thank you for the lecture. My name is Saad Rabia. Okay, my question is you overlook the, uh, excuse me here, I'm here, <laughs> okay. You overlook the rising of China in nuclear, number one. And number two, how about Iran-Korea cooperation? 
both of these questions, they are very, I mean, hot questions nowadays, and you overlook them. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you for that uh, excellent question. The Iran and Korea relationship is, Iran is certainly important in, in South Asia, but when it comes to nuclear deterrent stability, less so. China, on the other hand, is, is a very important player. But when I look at all these crises, historically speaking, uh, the role of the United States was fairly dominant. And while the Chinese certainly put pressure on both sides to uh, stabilize the situation in, in you know, 1990 or the Kargil War, uh, that was the, the, the two main factors were certainly the Pakistan's declared first use strategy and the U.S. Uh, pressure on both sides to calm down. But if, you, if I had to expand the region from South Asia to the greater Middle East, certainly a lot of those questions become very relevant. I'll take another question. The gentleman in the front, please. Uh, I want to speak Arabic, uh, please. Uh. Uh, and I'm Taysir Suleiman. I'm a government employee. Oh, we are uh, fortunate to see that there is a competition and a rivalry to possess nuclear weapons. And all people are unwise and not heeding to stability and security. How come some countries did not sign the treaties of non possession of the nuclear weapons? And why there is this uh, double? standard uh, by Israel uh, because we see that uh, Syria was uh, pressured to get rid of its uh, nuclear weapon in addition to Islamic and Arab country while Israel is not pressured to get rid of its nuclear weapon and why the nuclear weapon became one alibi to topple the uh, systems and regimes in the world no, excellent point you're referring to the Non-Nuclear um, Proliferation Treaty. And uh, there are serious challenges with that treaty. And you even saw when both India and Pakistan went nuclear, they talked about, well, the Indians called it the nuclear apartheid. In other words, why can't we have nuclear weapons when uh, the original five have them? Uh, more recently, in 2005 and six, the U.S.-India uh, civilian nuclear deal also bended a lot of rules uh, of the NPT, and that put pressure on, on, on the United States by the Pakistanis, and to some degree, rightly so. Uh, why are you bending the rules for the Indians and why not us? Uh, the, the, the case of Israel is very unique. It has nuclear weapons but has not declared. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how the world reacts if they were to declare them. But as of now, they have done fairly well keeping them secret, but making sure that people know that they have them. It goes back to the 1973 Israel-Arab War. So um, the question of fairness, um, who should have nuclear weapons and who shouldn't, generally speaking, uh, the lesser the few, depending on which side you come through. So, uh, the two theorists, for example, Ken, uh, Kenneth Wall said, the more the better. Uh, more people have them, less war, right? If you, you go with very classic nuclear deterrence theory, that it basically eliminates war. No two countries have gone to full-scale war. Kargil being a conventional war, but it was still limited. Uh, the crisis of 1969 between China and Soviet Union, but generally speaking. Uh, and that once you do, again, through, because of what, what we all said, and when you do get these nuclear weapons, you automatically become responsible. These are very special weapons, and you use them. Uh, you never use them, uh, but you use the threat uh, uh, in the most optimum way. Scott Sagan, for example, is on the other side. He said, less, less the better. Uh, newer countries that are joining the club uh, don't have the command and control centers, uh, the organizational issues, nuclear security issues. Uh, civil military imbalance uh, that so this is certainly a debate that goes on um, but once you do get these nuclear weapons I think then 
in many ways India and Pakistan are part of the club. They just haven't joined it. And the countries around them, and certainly the United States, has then funded uh, different programs to secure those nuclear weapons and trying to bring them into uh, kind of mainstream NPT. But NPT has, has serious, serious issues. Okay. The gentleman in the fourth row, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Malik. My name is uh, Dr. Ali Lamoudi. I'm an environmentalist as well as a former United Nations advisor. Uh, we know in this part of the world, everywhere, India, Pakistan, was one nation, Histri uh, historically, you know. And we know that the people, they, they speak the same language. They have many things in common, social, economical, geographical. India, Pakistan, when you say, you look as if it is one country. Now, you have already uh, elaborated the nuclear conflict. And those, the conflict, the nuclear war, all these things. We need to know what exactly the reasons for that. Is it from outside? Is it religion, religious you know, uh, reasons for that? Is it some, uh, you know, uh, some economical values? Because it, when it reaches to the nuclear, nuclear war, that means it's a conflict, something serious matter. So do you think that this has reasons from external sources, internally or regionally, or from, from the history? But we know that there was, it was the same nation, or both were the same nation. So I think, uh, with my respect, Mr. Malik, with your excellent you know, presentation, you didn't go, went deeply to the reasons of this conflict, whether it is. So I would, not, I would like to, if you can kindly elaborate on that. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and remember that I'm, I'm here for a very short period of time, but this lecture will then be converted into, uh, I believe, a 7,000 word publication where I'll go into details or something. In some of my factors, you did see the, the ethno-religious overlap. You're absolutely right. I think that it's, it's both. It's historic. Uh, there's, there's history there between the two countries. And then, of course, external elements involved as well, um, for obvious reasons. So you're, you're a region, you know, Pakistan surrounded by China, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, India, uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, you look at the 1980s and the United States support for the Afghan Mujahideen, all the funding, many of the training going through, through Pakistan. But going back to the history angle, it literally starts in 1947. And it's a, essentially a dispute of territory because, like you said correctly, that it's one country or one British colony and then it's divided and then it divides again in 1971. So, those both things are very relevant. Uh, the roots of nuclear deterrence instability, and that was my main focus in this lecture, but there are uh, several other factors, and history being one of them, that talk, that, that, that explain the causes of conflict between these two countries. And again, for example, Kashmir keeps coming back, uh, and how both countries have devised strategies to deal with these problems. Like I said, the good news is, uh, uh, you know, one of the silver linings is the 1960 uh, Indus Water Treaty. Both countries came together. This was a very key moment. Uh, there have been other great initiatives over, over the last five years. Pakistan and India both have removed many, many of the import restrictions uh, from the other side. So there's real potential on trade. But you're, you're, you're right. Other countries will intervene uh, as long as their national interests are at stake. Um, and like I said, the relationship with the Soviet Union and, uh, and Russia that, that India has and, and the historic relationship, very complex relationship that, that Pakistan has with the United States has also played a major role. Thank you. The gentleman at the back, please. Ah, good evening. Uh, my name is Mahmoud and I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Haider Malik. Um, have you outlined all the criteria that is necessary to make a nuclear 
deterrence, stability work out? And if not, uh, could you please clarify if there are other criteria or other set of regulation that we have to, 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 to take into consideration? Um, is the question clear or should I repeat? No, no, it's clear. It's clear. Very Thank clear. You. So in other words, how do you get nuclear deterrent stability, right? Uh, in the ideal world, you would resolve territorial disputes and you would resolve conventional military imbalance. In other words, two countries should have s similar qualitative and quantitative armies. Then you don't have to use the threat of nuclear weapons. And if you have major territorial disputes, resolve them. That's not going to happen. What is more likely is uh, at least the initiation of talks of not arms reduction but arms control, I increasing transparency between the two. Uh, hotlines were developed right after 2002, for example. There's a hotline now, and I think they've expanded it. The military leadership of the two countries gets together, talk to each other, being on the same page to avoid accidental launch, to avoid misperceptions. Pakistan may be just moving some warheads for maintenance purposes. Indian satellite picks it up, everybody freaks out. You want to avoid those kind of things, have more, more of that. And then start working on things that are, are more workable, more like trade over territory. I kept talking about that. So, you know, ideally, you, you would want to take away the main sources of instability. You can't, what you can do is try to minimize them. And again, it's a case by case. Like I, that's why I made the, made, made the comparison between US, Russia, and, and, and India and Pakistan. This is, this is a very different case. They, they share borders, they have an actual history of war, they are supporting insurgent groups within each other's territory. And frankly, you don't really need fancy you know, missile systems. <laughs> You, 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 can, you can cause a lot of damage, and Indians can cause a lot of damage in Pakistani cities and, and vice versa. So that's what, I'm, you know, that's what I would see as, as nuclear deterrent stability as they, both sides start talking and they focus on trade over territory. Thank you very much for the lecture. My name is Rashid and I am from Embassy of Pakistan. Uh, sir, while you focused on Khalistan movement, Kargil war and lashkar e taiba type of things, you probably forgot to mention in detail the ongoing separatist movement in Balochistan of Pakistan and Indian role through Afghanistan in promoting terrorism in Pakistan. I am referring to the consulates in the Afghanistan other than the embassy. In your opinion, with this kind of a scenario, what are the options available to Pakistan other than the nukes to forestall and deter this, uh, con this enemy which is larger than that in conventional terms? Thank you very much. I think there's no doubt that you know, the main reason Pakistan um, acquired nuclear weapons was after the breakup of Pakistan in 1971. And the good news is that they have been deterred from large-scale conflict even after having several crises from the brass tacks to 2008 Mumbai. It's a good news. The bad news is you can't really deter the Indian support for Baloch insurgents or the Pakistani support for Kashmiri insurgents. That, that kind of limited conflict uh, goes forward. And like I said, in all these cases, when Pakistan did support these groups and these groups either through direct direction or on their own went ahead or were out of control or whatever the case was that that causes both countries to escalate to the nuclear level the country with a weaker military will always escalate faster which will have strategies that are more dangerous precisely because once the indian three corps enter into pakistan from punjab kashmir and sindh they don't have a lot of choice but to use tactical nuclear their weapons on the Indian Army in their own territory. So th that, that is a purely defensive strategy in that sense. So it makes perfect sense to have that. What, what, is, what, what needs to go down is that, that these crises will lead to uh, a bigger crisis and that it will not always be resolved by US pressure and the threat of force. 
because in, in the end there will be pressure built up on both sides to react. And as in the case of Pakistan, as more and more tactical nuclear weapons, plutonium-based, which are smaller, are given to these commanders uh, at perhaps at the division level, perhaps lower, there may be more chances of accidental launch. Also the, the issue of domestic terrorism on both sides, but certainly more in the Pakistani side because groups that are anti-Pakistan have openly talked about acquiring at least a new, you know, dirty bomb, things like that. So, no, I didn't, I didn't want to, I, I stood mentioned, I did mention that both countries have this tit for tat where they're supporting insurgent groups on the other side. It's said that what has been reported and what we have seen is that certainly more has been done on one side than the other. Final question. The gentleman in the front, please. Okay, we'll make them two questions, no problem. They're really keen to answer. Uh, I'm uh, Air Commodore Rizwan from the Pakistan Embassy. Uh, I'd like to uh, highlight the point that you mentioned in the US-India uh, civil nuclear uh, collaboration and deal. Uh, this allows the Indian side to get uh, additional fissile material uh, from the market, whereas diverting its own uh, towards military, uh, for the enriched material towards military side which puts pressure on Pakistan's side to match up so as to maintain its uh, deterrence capability. Uh, this kind of preferential treatment, do you think uh, is uh, helping establish stability within the region, or is it actually moving the two countries towards instability as far as the uh, nuclear proliferation uh, or uh, nuclear uh, capabilities is concerned? Second, uh, once we have the uh, Pakistan does get to match, if at all, uh, the nuclear uh, threat or the nuclear capability to maintain its level of uh, deterrence. The security or the stability instability paradox, which says that strategic stability, st uh, stability at the strategic level causes instability at the tactical level, which would, pref which would practically mean that both the countries after, if at all, they develop stability by virtue of nuclear arms at the strategic level, will actually get into conventional uh, build-ups, a race, whereby finding space within the subconventional domain so as to build up their conventional militaries uh, to match. This again is going to start not only an arms race in the nuclear, but also in the non-nuclear in the conventional field. So these are the two questions. Does this really contribute towards stability? or instability, the, these acts. And the third thing that I'd like to highlight is uh, the map that was displayed. Uh, the Kashmir is still recognized by the United Nations as a disputed territory, whereas the map showed as it, uh, an uh, part of the Indian side. I request uh, that the maps which are UN-recognized may please be used in, certain, in these presentations. OK. Uh, the map comes from Google, and, and it's very clear that the, the dotted part is disputed. So when you saw the line of control, everything that was dotted was a disputed territory. Not only uh, between India and Pakistan, but also between uh, India and China. So I, I don't know if that was clear or not. That came directly from, from Google. But, but your more substantial question and comment. Um, India and Pakistan need little encouragement to get involved in an arms race. They've been part of an arms race for a long time. India has been focused a lot on the conventional side and has a superior conventional military, but also has a closer mill-to-mill -mill relationship with the United States. And the United States uh, has a certain, you know, certain benchmarks for, uh, I'm of the opinion that if certain benchmarks are, are fulfilled by the Pakistanis when it comes to nuclear security, uh, resolving certain disputes, that there is uh, you know, guarded optimism that something similar may be granted uh, to the Pakistanis. But I don't think the Pakistanis waited for that. Uh, the Chinese have already started investing heavily uh, in the nuclear sector. And um, I think right after the uh, US-India deal was approved, China stepped in. So I think that takes care of that imbalance. But you're right, there's nothing, there's nothing stable about this, uh, whether it's at the conventional level or subconventional level. If you're not supporting insurgent groups, then India is spending massively on on, on, on submarines and 
advanced missile systems and upgrading um, their air force and and their defense budget is you know more than ten times um, than the Pakistani budget so that that's certainly a case but in realistically speaking that balance cannot be fixed by anybody regardless of who who comes to the rescue of Pakistan in other words if you look at the foreign aid military to military coming in the United States still has the largest sum coming in you've got China you've got Saudi Arabia other allies that have that's not going to change dramatically. Uh, so what is important to look at this relationship uh, is to have countries like UAE, where we are right now, certainly the United States, push these countries towards trade talks over territorial disputes and try to minimize um, chances of accidental launch and other issues on the border, for example, what you see today or you saw a couple of weeks ago uh, by increasing transparency and communication. So that, that, that's kind of more reasonable. I know it's not, it's not very dramatic and that, that's because these things work very slowly and the United States has had pushback from, from India, frankly, from intervening uh, on the issue of uh, Kashmir, for example. And this is, this is an ongoing dispute that, that's going to uh, only be resolved by some of these confidence building measures that I uh, mentioned. And like I said, both countries don't need any encouragement from any side uh, to continue their arms race. Uh, one will certainly be more. So I think there, there are people in Pakistan, for example, that certainly believe in increasing trade and, and using that as a, uh, uh, a leverage point to get to a point where um, both countries can at least move forward and not have incidents like Mumbai or, or the repeat of, of Cargill. Final question, please. Well, I can't resist the lady as well. Bushara <laughs> Makawi uh, from International Center for Energy Systems, Abu Dhabi. Uh, my question is really reference Hiroshima and Chernobyl. Can anybody use nuclear anymore? Also, reference to the global economic situation, which is really unresolved, will that also may cause a desperate act of using nuclear? I, I'm sorry, the last part. Could you repeat the last part? The economic situation global, which is not resolved, can it also cause a desperate use of nuclear? I know I don't believe so. I think the, it's very low likelihood for something like that. Uh, but you did see recently, as far as nuclear-related incidents, you saw that in Japan, um, the nuclear power plants in the, after uh, um, the tsunami. For, uh, and um, there's always concerns about uh, insider threats and things like that. Uh, but remember, the power of nuclear weapons is not that you can use them is because you can threaten the use of them. So it gives you enormous, enormous leverage in negotiations. Like I, uh, like I said, you know, in the past, if the Pakistani military or supported groups had crossed the line of control into Kashmir, like in 1965, the Indian, Indians would have opened up a second or a third front, and you didn't see that anymore. So of course, it's deterring major large-scale conflict, and uh, that's the leverage that you get. But there's always concerns about not only Pakistani or Indian uh, nuclear power plants or storage facilities, but also a lot in Eastern Europe and former um, Soviet Union uh, countries that still have uh, unaccounted nuclear material. And that's very dangerous, and there are initiatives in the United States that are working on securing those. We will conclude with the sweet lady in the front with the last question. I would appreciate the three uh, deterrence mechanism that you have uh, put for the relationship, the partnership between the United States and UAE relations uh, as economic, energy economic and military. Yes. But in my opinion, 
to ensure sustainable, sustainable peace between the neighboring countries, India and Pakistan, we also need to use education to transform the mindset of the present and the new generations to perceive them, the, each other in terms of good neighborliness and mutual dependence for prosperity, not just the present. It's good neighborliness, which is now missing in the education of both countries when they perceive each other. And given the heritage of UAE as a regional peace expert and its cordial relations with Pakistan and excellent relations with India with mutual respect, UAE has great potential to, through public opinion and social engineering to impact and transform, to bring about this transformation of mindsets so neighbors perceive each other, and particularly the younger generation, not as rivals, but as neighbors, as good neighborliness. And in the future, that will be more of a deterrence because the mindsets were already changed psychologically, rather than uh, the other mechanisms of deterrence. Thank you. I, I absolutely agree. I couldn't have said it better. Um, certain, like I said, you know, UAE playing a role as a bridge, but you talk about the uh, changing the perceptions on both sides, education. I talk very briefly about these NGOs that are working on both sides. They could certainly uh, use help from UAE. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I, I absolutely agree. I have nothing to add. Thank you, Mr. Malik, for this very enriching lecture. Um, we thank uh, Mr. Haidar Malik for this uh, rich uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And we invite you to the dinner uh, buffet. Uh, please uh, follow the signs. Uh, thank you very much, and peace be upon you.